Well, hey, man, church. Good morning, High Point family. We're going to dismiss our kids out to the side doors and uh, go on out to your Sunday school classes. Our youth are doing alpha, so they're already in there. If you're a youth and you missed that, uh, you can go back to the youth room if you want, if they're still back there. My wife is leading that class, so it'll be good. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Brandon McCauley. I'm the lead pastor here at High Point, and I, I just love you guys. Uh, if you don't know, I love our church family here. And uh, I hope you feel welcomed, and I hope you feel like part of the family. If you don't ever feel like part of the family, like an outsider, c- come talk to me. We'll, f- we'll fix that up, right? Because that's how, that's how we should be uh, as the body of Christ. So um, before we get going, can I just take a moment, and, and we want to pray for uh, the conflict in Russia and Ukraine again, and just ask the Lord. It's, it's clearly been escalating and escalating, and people are suffering. And so we want to just go to the Lord and ask him, Uh, to be in the midst of that. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you with heavy hearts uh, over this war that's in Ukraine, and we pray that you would be merciful uh, on the people of both Ukraine and Russia and prevent any further violence. We pray for those who have lost homes and jobs and friends and family. We ask that you comfort and provide for the needs of those who are suffering. Bring your mercy and your justice to this brokenness and be the peace that these nations need. We ask, Lord, that you strengthen and encourage the church in both Russia and in Ukraine and all around the world to proclaim the truths of your kingdom to these people and to make them bold to show the love of Jesus in this difficult situation. We ask that you to be present in the midst of all this, knowing that you are the sovereign Lord and a God who is good. We love you, we praise you, in the precious name of Jesus we ask, amen. So church, our sermon series is called Listen, and we are in our third week as we look at the church of Pergamum. Uh, Still to this day, one of my favorite churches to visit of the seven churches, Uh, just an incredible spot, Um, and we'll get more into that in a minute, but uh, throughout the book of Revelation, uh, if you read it like from cover to cover, Uh, Satan himself is depicted as a foe, as our enemy, who in a final act of desperation is waging war on the people of God. And he's depicted to us as a defeated foe. He's already lost the battle. Christ has already died. And in a final act of desperation, he's, he's empowering. He's empowering both the beast to persecute the church And in other instances, he'll he'll, uh, take a much more subtle approach and he'll empower the harlot to seduce the church away from the one true God. Like the church of Smyrna that we heard about last week from Pastor Dan, the church in Pergamum faced heavy persecution under the Roman Empire. But they also faced an enemy that was present within. This harlot who deceives the church into committing spiritual adultery. Now I want us to keep in mind as we listen to all of these sermons over the next several weeks. That as Jesus speaks, he is speaking to seven specific congregations who are dealing with real circumstances. These were real people going through real situations. Difficult situations. But as he's describing those situations to us, as we hear what those Christians were dealing with, we must also remember that he is speaking directly to us as well. This is why every single letter contains the refrain, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this letter is a difficult one. I'm going to confess right at the beginning. Some of you might not like me after this, but as always, as always, I will say one thing to you. Please don't leave the church without coming to talk to me first. If we disagree, that's, you know, that's the way it has to go fine. But if you're upset today, or if you're just angry, I'm here. Let's have a conversation like brothers and sisters, right? So, prefacing that. And letting you know I love you. And I'm also the kind of pastor that when these passages come up, I'm not going to skip it. I'm just not. 
So, so that's good, but I want us, let's stand together. Let's stand, and I want us to read this letter together. Let's read this, these words that Jesus says to the church at Pergamum. I'll have the words on the screen for us. Let's read them in unison with one voice and hear what Jesus Christ has written to the church at Pergamum. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Let's bow our heads together, church. Lord Jesus, we ask us, ask you to sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Instruct our hearts, conform our minds to your likeness, and draw us near to you that we might know you and be more like you. And Lord, we too just want to take a moment and pray for the churches that are around us, that your word would go out faithfully amongst that congregation, those congregations as well, and that we, as the body of Christ here in Cedar Park and Leander and in North Austin, would be united and would glorify Christ together so that the nations, the people of these cities would know that you are God. We praise you and we thank you for this time in your precious word. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. So I'm going to put a map up on the screen for you all. The city of Pergamum is actually 65 miles north of the city of Smyrna. It looks like a long way on the map, but it's just about an hour drive, not too far. And it was actually the seat of the Roman government in all of Asia. It was the seat of the Roman government in all of Asia. So this was a significant political city. At the time, it also had the second largest library in the world, uh, second actually only to Alexandria in Egypt. The city of Pergamon had many pagan temples, like most of the Roman cities. That, like Smyrna, it had this religious center as part of the city life. It had temples dedicated to Zeus, Athena, Demeter, and Dionysius. And there was also a temple dedicated to a guy named Asclepius, who was the Roman god of healing and whose symbol you might recognize. Go to your doctor's office. You go to get some prescriptions. You will see that symbol, uh, the serpent wrapped around a staff. That was the symbol of Asclepius, the god of healing. Pergamum was a pagan city that offered many of its citizens salvation in the name of Zeus or Asclepius or even Caesar himself. It's made it a very difficult place for Christians to profess that Jesus Christ is the only Lord. Christians of Pergamum were often subject to expulsion from the city or imprisonment, or even sentenced to death by the Roman government. And it was because of their refusal to call Caesar Lord that prompted the Roman rulers to respond to the Christians this way. And it's one of the reasons why Christians in Pergamum had such a difficult time following Christ. Now, we'll get into some of the history, more of the history of the city, but let me look first at verse 12 and look at this description that Christ gives us of himself. 
He says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, to the, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now the sword is symbolic of Jesus Christ coming to this church in his high kingly office to bring judgment upon the enemies of the church. Now the sword symbolizes Christ's power to judge all things according to the truth of God's word. And it warns the church of Christ's impending judgment upon them as well if they do not repent. But the sword is also symbolic of something else. You see, the emperor of Rome would grant to his political officials what was called the power of the sword. And it was basically the ability to enact capital punishment at their discretion. So if they felt like you were an enemy of Rome, they could put you to death with no trial. They had the power of the sword to anyone who didn't acknowledge Caesar as Lord. Now, the Roman Empire was waging war on the Christians, especially the Christians here in Pergamum. And Jesus uses the symbol of the sword to remind the believers in the church of who really wields the power of justice and authority. You see, it is only Christ who can truly enact judgment. And Christ will bring judgment to those who persecute his church, and he comforts those believers with that promise. Now let's look together at verses 13 to 16. Jesus says this, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and you do not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, it's interesting that Jesus calls Pergamum the place where Satan dwells, right? Where he has his throne. And this is a kind of a far off picture I want to show you because uh, Pergamum is actually atop the city. These ruins here are not part of Pergamum in the front. So it's everything in the, in the background. Uh, it sits on top of this really rocky hill, and almost 360 degrees ar around is this huge valley. There's actually just one little road that goes up the backside. And this city hits, sits almost 1,000 feet above the surrounding area. So it was a significant visual spot if you were anywhere else. And on the top of the hill in the center of the city... So you see the little uh, theater there kind of sloped down? It's actually really, really steep. Uh, I sang Amazing Grace at the bottom of those steps there uh, with some friends. Um, but it's really steep. It's beautiful. But right behind that is kind of this flat top part of the city. And right there stood a 90-foot square altar to Zeus the Savior. Zeus, the Savior of the city. And here's a picture of that altar. Now this uh, is a representation of what the altar would look like. This is actually in Berlin. If you ever go to the city of Berlin, there is a museum of Pergamum in Berlin. And what they did was recreate the altar of Zeus inside the museum, life-size. It's massive. Uh, there's actually pictures of people walking up the, like the steps of this altar. And so you can imagine, as someone who went to the city of Pergamum, you could see in the distance this massive altar sitting on top of the hill like a massive throne where Satan dwells. These pagan priests who served the god Zeus would burn sacrifices in this altar 24 hours a day on rotation. And this is important for us because when we hear Jesus say to the church, I know where you dwell, he knows exactly what the Christians in Pergamum were facing. He knew exactly what was going on in the city. 
And as they walked and as they tried to follow Christ, he knew exactly what it would have been like for them to live in a city permeated with idolatry and sexual morality. Jesus knows where they're at. He knows what they faced. And he encourages them. Because despite this difficulty, despite the difficulty of the idolatry on every corner, despite the difficulty of a culture that said all these sexual practices are no big deal, he said, you were faithful to me anyways. They didn't give up their first love like Ephesus did. They remained in love with Jesus. They were faithful to the Lord. In verse 13, we are told that they remained faithful even when Antipas, who church history tells us was the bishop of Pergamum. Antipas was a guy uh, installed to the church of Pergamum by John the Apostle himself. John uh, ordained um, Antipas and he sent him to Pergamum and he was the bishop of that city. And they were remained faithful to the Lord even when they killed their leader. They still followed Christ. And this guy Antipas, we're told, was put to death where Satan dwells. Now, historically, we don't actually know if he was killed uh, in the altar of Zeus. We don't know. Uh, there's some differing stories. But either way, whether he was in Pergamum or they had dragged him off to some Roman city and executed him there, the church would have heard about it. They would have heard about their leader being killed at the hands of the Roman Empire, and they remained faithful. See, the church had been faced with persecution and death, but they still loved Jesus. And even though they faced this persecution at the point of a Roman sword, they were faithful. Despite all that, though, the Lord still has some strong correction for this church. This is where it gets a little more difficult. Because the church in Pergamum had decided to promote or to allow false teaching within the church. And they were practicing sexual immorality while still claiming that to follow Jesus Christ. Now Jesus reminds them that this is the time for them to repent. Or he will come and not just fight against those who persecute the church but he will fight against these false teachers that are leading his people astray. It says he will do that with the sword of his mouth, with the word of God. Now, the issue in Pergamum is similar to what the Smyrna Christians were facing because they were both persecuted people, persecuted by the Roman government. But there's one exception because the, the folks in Smyrna we're persecuted, and we don't actually hear any negative things about the church in Smyrna. We're just told that they, they need to persevere. But in this church, in Pergamum itself, the, te the, the people were drawn away by the seductive teachings, deception of false teachers, and not because of the persecution they were facing. You see, these false teachers were leading people astray with the teachings of Balaam. Now, if you remember the story of Balaam, it's found in Numbers chapter 22 to 25. And Balaam is misleading Israel into worshiping idols and to practice sexual morality through his deceptive counsel to the king. Look what it says in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. It says, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Later on in Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, we're told why this happened. It says, Behold, these on Balaam's advice, caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident at Peor. And so the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. We're not going to unpack the whole plague, and that's a number series. We'll do that maybe another time. 
But basically what happened was Balaam uh, advised King Balak to have the Israel to lure the Israelites into sinful practices by enticing them with Moabite women and to share pagan meals that were sacrificed to idols. And Jesus warns this church that the teaching of the Nicolaitans was doing the exact same thing that Balaam did to Israel. They have repeated Balaam's foolishness and had led the believers in Pergamum into this same trap that the Israelites had fallen into. And just like Israel, when the Jewish people sought to worship both Yahweh and Baal, the Christians in Pergamum believed that they could worship Jesus, call him Lord, and participate in the pagan ceremonies and sexual practices that dominated the city they lived in. They believed the lie that their culture should lead them into the lives that they live and not the word of God. Now, it's interesting to note on a side note, the name Balaam means he who destroys the people. And the name of Nicholas, of the Nicolaitans, means he who conquers the people. Interesting parallel. That's maybe another, I'll get another sermon for another day, but just a little tidbit there. Now, this same issue, this same issue of eating meat sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality is addressed in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council. So we have a New Testament uh, kind of provision for what was going on and how the church leaders decided we, the body of Christ, should handle it or live in response. And it was there that these church leaders agreed that salvation is through faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone, right? And the Gentiles should avoid eating meat used in pagan sacrifices. They should avoid the sexual immorality that was present in their world that day. And these church believers uh, did it because they didn't want us to condone the practice of animal sacrifice. Why? Because you and I don't need to sacrifice for our sins any longer. We have already been given the perfect sacrifice in Jesus himself. And we need no other. We need no other sacrifice for sins. So condoning a practice which then says your sin is forgiven through the blood of an, a goat or a bull is, is nonsense. And the first century church says don't participate in anything that condones that kind of behavior. They also affirmed the biblical truth that Christians are to abstain from all sexual practices outside of sex within the, within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. This is where you might get angry at me or disagree, and that's fine. But the Jerusalem Council said that all believers are not to live with any sexual immorality, which at that time meant the only acceptable practice is between a man and a woman in the confines of marriage. That is the only one that is allowed, and again, the church doesn't like to talk about this, but we're going to talk about it today. So if you feel squirmy, then I'll give you a hug later. <laughs> now, I want to share this quote from Pastor Sam Storms. So I think it just kind of sums up this issue in a, in a really nice way. He encourages, he says this, he says, don't believe the propaganda the world is peddling. This is not God's way of robbing you of fun and pleasure. It is his passionate desire to intensify it. This prohibition exists in order to protect and preserve the beauty and joy of marital sex. Our laws against theft and murder exist because of the high value we place on personal property and human life. So too with this prohibition against illicit sex. The purpose is to guard, preserve, and enhance something far more exciting, fun, and full of pleasure, namely marital love. Church, this is not what the culture says is the way. 
And this was a significant issue in the city of Pergamum because the standard practice in Roman temples included temple prostitution. You would make your sacrifice, and then you would get your whore, and you'd go do your business. This was a normal thing. They also would have these feasts where they would take the meat offered on the altar, and they would just have a big party. But basically, those parties were nothing less than drunken orgies. This was what Christians in Pergamum were dealing with. This is what they were participating in. While claiming to be followers of Jesus. Just, when, just like when the Israelites had sexual relations with these Moabite women, the Christians in Pergamum saw nothing wrong with sexual involvement with temple prostitutes or in these feasts of immorality and idolatry. They just said, this is what the culture does. This is what the people around me do. I've been invited, and I'm going to go and participate. Now, I'm going to come back to this, but I want to move on just for time's sake. Look with me at verse 17, and we'll come back to these uh, other lovely things. Christ says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Jesus tells these believers that those who conquer by remaining faithful will eat from the hidden manna. Now, what is the hidden manna? It's really easy. Jesus makes this one abundantly clear in John chapter 6, verse 48 to 51. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. They died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. It literally can't be spelled out more clearly. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Church, this is why communion is here every week. Not because it's the actual flesh of God but because it is a reminder that we have been given a promise. The promise of the bread of life in which we will taste of the, everything the Lord has done in his sacrifice and we will live with him forever. What a precious gift. Now he also promises that those who overcome, those who conquer, will be given a white stone with a new name. Now, this one's a little trickier. There's not a passage that directs us exactly to what this means, but I have a few ideas. I think, first off, a white stone would symbolize purity. White stones were actually fairly rare in this day and age. They were prized possessions if you had one. But they symbolized purity, which would have been a great comfort to those Pergamon believers who had fallen into the temptation of sexual sin. And Christ is reminding them, you have been forgiven. You have been made pure. Your sexual failures, your sinful practices aren't held against you anymore. You can be made pure again. And on that stone, we're told, it was written a new name with only the one who receives it will know. Church, Christ has given you a new name. You might not know it yet. I don't know mine. That's okay. But we see this all, all throughout Scripture, right? We see Christ coming to people and giving them a new name, which is a symbol of giving them new life. We have Abraham, Abram becoming Abraham. We have Sarai becoming Sarah. We have Saul becoming Paul and Cephas becoming Peter. And in every one of those circumstances, we see a life that was broken and destitute because of sin become whole again. Used for the glory of God. 
That is what your new name represents. And even though he might not have spoken that name to you yet, the truth is still yours. The promise is still yours. No matter your sin, no matter your background, no matter your struggles, you have been purified, forgiven, given another chance to follow after the Lord with your whole life. This white stone reminds us that we are, in fact, a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Church, can I tell you something? This isn't a one-day transformation that happens. (laughs) You might be sitting there wondering, like, I still struggle with these things. What's going on? Yes, we we all do. This is reality. You are being purified. You are being sanctified. You are being transformed into Christ's likeness. And you will have that full realization on the day you stand before him in glory. Now, I want to ask some hard questions, ones you won't like. But I love you. You know, I've got to remind you, you know, just in case you forget. Have you been seduced by the false teachings of this world? You see, our culture says something very clear about what sex should look like or what your right to it is. Have you compromised what the Word of God says is right? Do you worship Christ alone, or have you given your heart to other lovers? Have you bent your knee to the idols of this world and practiced sexual things outside of the marriage bed? If you have, let me encourage you with the words of Hebrews chapter 3. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. So that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. There's a key phrase in there I want to exhort you with. Examine your heart. See if it has been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Church, this is what sin does. This is why our world is where it is right now. Because we allow a little bit of sin to come in and it leavens the whole lump. A little bit of sin, just a taste. It's okay if I look at that on my computer. It's just one time. It's okay if I lust after this one. She's she's hot. No one will know. It's okay if I sleep with my girlfriend before we get married. We're going to get married anyways. It's fine. A little bit of sin hardens the heart. The deceitfulness of sin corrupts this. So much so that if you continue in it, you will stop calling it sin and will call it normal practice. This is where our world is right now. Where we look at the sexual milieu of the day and we say, that's normal. It's okay. Just people being people. They deserve it. We owe it to them. It is their right. Nonsense. Sex itself has become an idol for us today. And it's not just out there. It is in here. And it is in here. It is out there. It is in here. And it is in here. So examine your heart, church. See if there be any deceitful way within you. Because idolatry and sexual morality are everywhere. 
And the enemy is doing everything he can to deceive you and to pull you away from the truth of the one true God. If we would have Jesus as Lord over every area of our lives, we must first take care to not shame sexual intimacy as, it's not, as if it's not one of the greatest gifts the Lord has given husbands and wives. Right? The Puritans tried to deal with sexual intimacy by saying, well, just don't do any of it. It's all bad. No, it's beautiful. And if you're married, you should be doing it. This is my plug for married couples. Just, you can thank me later. If you're not, there's another problem going on. We'll talk about that another day. It is one of God's greatest gifts to husbands and wives. On the flip side, we must be careful not to let ourselves become so obsessed with sex that we surrender to our culture's obsession with it. As if sexual pleasure is simply a matter of basic right. Or if every lust-filled desire in your heart has to somehow be satisfied, it doesn't. Put those to death. Christians in the congregation at Pergamum saw nothing wrong with saying, Jesus, you're my Lord. Great are you, Lord. And then going off to the temple to have a little prostitute on the side. Or, hey, my neighbor invited me to this feast. You know, they offered some meat to the idols. It was fine. They barbecued it really nice. Christ tells this church to repent, to flee, to turn from any temptation that even resembles that and run the other way. Flee from idolatry. Flee from every form of sexual immorality. Lust. That basically condemns us all. Premarital sex. Pornography. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing more damaging to your marital relationship than pornography. Maybe the greatest idol in our culture today. Run from it. It is destructive, it is ugly, and it will destroy your heart. And it will make you believe things about your wife or your spouse that are not true. All of these things, anything outside the confine of a marriage between a man and a woman is sin. There's no other way around it, church. Any sexual activity outside the confines of the marriage bed is sin. And I don't care if you're 12 or you're 80. The temptation is still there. And the enemy knows it's the easiest way to get into your heart. And all of these sinful practices are drawing you away from your Lord. And it's time to confess and turn back to him. I want to read us some encouragement from Craig Rochelle, the pastor. He says, it's time to get healed. It's time to confess. This is step one in defeating these kinds of practices. Falling for the bait doesn't make you the worst person in the world. Church, we are all sinners. And I don't care what your background is, what your struggles are. You belong here with Christ, who desires to make you whole. You were snared, you were hooked, but you don't have to stay that way. Now is the time to deal with the shackles that keep you enslaved. Church, these things enslave your heart unlike anything else in our culture. They keep you a slave to your sin. They make you someone that you're not. He says, today you can leave the prison that sexual immorality has created from your past mistakes. Hear your father's voice call out to you above the noisy clamor of our culture. He says, I love you. Even if you struggle with these things, he loves you. We love you. The church loves you. 
No failure, no sinful practice keeps you away from this. All are welcome here. He says, you're free to go now because sexual sin has no hold on you. Church, the blood of Christ has covered all sin, all failures, past, present, future. And he says, repent and come back to him. He is always, always, always going to forgive you if you simply come to him with humility and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Come back to his grace. Come back to his forgiveness, his wholeness, and his purity. He has a white stone with your name on it. He is ready to forgive you, to heal you, and to call you his own. Hear what the church, hear, he, sorry, I killed that ending. Darn. I got distracted by the clock. <laughs> he is ready to forgive you, to heal you, and to call you his own. And, and let me just, I'm going to go on a side since I, since I bummed that ending there. Can I just say, we want to walk with you. If this has been your struggle, uh, can you please write me an email? Send me a text. Come by the office. I, we, the leaders, the staff, the shepherds, the people in this church want to serve you and walk with you in this. Because I know how prevalent it is. I was a youth pastor long enough to know. And I was also a youth pastor long enough to know that it's not just contained there in the youth. It's a struggle, and it's a temptation that Satan has put in front of all of our faces to draw us away from Christ, and all he wants for you is to say, here I am, Lord. Make me yours again. Make me holy. Make me pure. Be my God again. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you first and foremost for the forgiveness of sin. Lord, we confess that there is not one of us in this room that has not fallen in some way or another in this area. If we believe that, Lord, we're lying to ourselves. Help us to walk in purity, in wholeness, in the grace and mercy of our God. Help us to honor you with our very lives. To not take the idols of this world and believe that they rule the day when we know clear and full well what your word has told us. Lord, give us strength to follow you. Help us to bind up uh, the brokenhearted amongst us, to drag them along if we need to. Or because you have made the way for us to be holy. Because you are perfectly holy. We love you. We praise you. We exalt your holy name. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus, whose mercy has covered all our sin. And all God's people said, Amen.